Let's talk about credit default swaps or CDSs. Now credit default swaps have been in the news quite a bit and have been credited with at least part of the financial crisis that occurred in 2008. Now credit default swap is an over-the-counter contract between the seller of the credit default swap and the buyer of the credit default swap against the risk of default on a set of debt obligations issued by a reference entity. Now what do we mean by that? We mean it by an over-the-counter contract, the contract is privately negotiated between the buyer and the seller rather than traded on an exchange and the reference entity would be some specific company. Essentially, it's an insurance policy that protects the buyer of the credit default swap against the loss of principal on a bond in case of a default by the issuer of that bond. The CDS buyer pays a premium, just like you would in, in an insurance contract, over the life of the contract as in it, and is covered for that period. So it's really an insurance policy. If a certain pre-specified credit event occurs, the premium payment stops and the protection seller pays the buyer the par value of the bond. So this is the case just like with an insurance policy. If you got into an accident, okay, the insurance company would pay you for that accident, although you would still continue to pay your premium. Here, the premium stops because that's it. If you, you're talking about an insurance policy, you still need coverage after the accident. But in this case, you get the par value of the bonds, you stop paying, end of story. If no credit event occurs during the term of the swap, the protection buyer continues to pay the premium until maturity. So that certainly makes sense. You just keep paying to the insurer. A CDS is triggered if during the term of protection, an event that materially affects the cash flows of the reference bond takes place. And that credit event could be a bankruptcy, <clears throat> um, a default of a bond, okay, or of other debt issued by the reference entity. It could be a downgrade in the credit rating. Okay, a restructuring can also be a credit event in some but not all credit default swaps. And a restructuring may mean a reduction in the principal or, or interest. Uh, there may be some deferral of the payments. So there are a lot of things that can be considered credit events. Issuers of credit default swaps generally don't like this provision because any sort of restructuring would, crit, uh, would trigger this credit event. And some of these restructurings are minor, minor things, and they don't want to have to pay because of some minor event occurring. Okay, When a credit event triggers the CDS, the contract settled and terminated, as we said before. And settlement can be physical or it can be cash. The person who bought the CDS, the protection buyer, has a right to deliver any deliverable debt obligation of the reference entity to the CDS seller in exchange for the par value. So there will be some rules in terms of what they can deliver. They can deliver the, the bonds that are insured. They may be able to deliver some other bonds of the company, and there may be some adjustment for the price. Okay, why would a firm purchase a CDS? Well, one reason is, for example, a pension fund may wish to purchase the bonds of a company. So let's call that company X. And pension funds need to hold very safe assets. So they may be required to hold the bonds that are rated, quote, investment grade. And suppose this company's bond rating is too low. For example, it's double B. The pension fund enters into a CDS with some other company. Okay, let's use AIG. AIG wrote a whole lot of credit default swaps back in the mid-2000s, uh, mid and again, that was one of the reasons for the financial crisis and one of the reasons that the government had to bail them out. And at the time, let's say AIG was rated double A. Okay. AIG insures the bond. If company X defaults, the pension fund will receive the face value of the bonds from AIG. 
So the pension fund has transformed a double B rated bond into a double A rated bond, basically because that's AIG's rating, and AIG is guaranteeing that, look, we'll pay off if company X defaults. So you don't care about company X's uh, bond rating. You only care about AIG's bond rating because they're the ones that will pay off if there's a default. If there's no default, then X just pays off, no problem. So let's take a look at a picture here. Um, you have a pension fund. Suppose they want to buy $5 billion worth of bonds from Company X, but Company X is rated double B by Moody's or Standard & Poor's, and I don't remember who uses the capital double B. Okay, each bond rating agency has different letters that they use, but basically the ratings are quite similar. Um, so they can't buy those because they're rated too low, but Company X wants to pay them 12%. And that's a really good return, according to the pension fund. So think about it, $5 billion, 12%, that's $600 million a year in interest. So the pension fund says, hmm, let's buy a credit default swap or insurance from AIG, and we'll pay them 1%. So in this case, they've transformed this double B rating into AIG's double A rating. If nothing happens, they just pass on the 1% to AIG. It's good for AIG because AIG is cashing in on this. They're getting 1% uh, of $5 billion. That's uh, 50, uh, $50 million every year to protect against Company X. And they figure Company X is probably not going to go bankrupt. They're probably not going to trigger some default event. So they just keep collecting the premiums. Okay, the problem with this is even though AIG is, is acting as an insurance company, writing an insurance policy, they're not behaving as an insurance company. In insurance, insurance companies are required by law to set aside funds to pay potential losses. So your insurance company, when you buy an auto insurance policy, is putting aside some of your premiums to pay any potential payouts that they may have to make because you make a claim you're in an accident and you do some property damage, damage your car, okay, some liability, etc. They put some money aside. But these kinds of contracts did not require that they set money aside. So AIG didn't set any money aside. And AIG could also choose to sell CDSs on the same company over and over again. Think about it. What happens if that firm defaults? They're not paying just once. They may be paying 10, 11, 12, may pay, be paying hundreds of, of different um, you know, pension funds who have bought a credit default swap on, for example, Lehman Brothers. So that's a real problem. Okay? That's another problem that, in terms of how they behave. They didn't behave like insurance companies. And this, even though it's insurance, isn't regulated like insurance. Insurance requires that you only be able to insure something that you have some economic stake in. Okay? You can buy life insurance on your spouse because you're counting on his or her income should that person pass away. You can buy homeowner's insurance on your house because if the house burns down, it's an economic loss to you. But you can't buy homeowner's insurance on somebody else's house. You can't buy life insurance on, on the President of the United States' life just because you want to do that. You can only insure something you have an economic stake in. Okay? But here, people could buy credit default swaps. Okay? Some firms bought it because they had the bonds of Lehman Brothers, for example. Some may have just been betting against Lehman Brothers. Okay? It was you know, why did AIG keep doing this? It was very profitable, okay? As long as the company doesn't default, doesn't trigger that, that um, credit event, they're cashing in, you know, millions, okay? Billions of dollars or even billions of dollars, okay? But once the defaults occur, okay, that's a real problem, okay? Here's how the mechanics of the credit default swap look. Um, generally speaking. 
okay, you have the credit default swap buyer, and <clears throat> there's sort of two panels to this diagram. The upper panel here is what happens before a credit event, okay? Here are the cash flows. The quarterly swap premium is just passed from the buyer of the credit default swap to the seller of the credit default swap, okay? Once the credit event has occurred, okay, a bankruptcy, a downgrade in the rating of the company, whatever that credit event is, the quarterly swap premium, if it's paid quarterly, stops, okay? That's the, here's the date of the credit event. So the CDS buyer doesn't pay the premium anymore. The seller of the CDS gives, sends the cash equal to the face value of the bonds to the CDS buyer, and the CDS buyer sends the bonds to the CDS seller. So here you have the case where, hey, I give you the bonds, okay, credit event occurred, I own these bonds, I give you the bonds, you give me the cash equivalent. So I know I got the full value of the bonds. Now it may turn out that, that the credit event doesn't um, affect these too much and the credit default swap seller does okay, doesn't lose too much money, but these could, bonds could be worthless and I get the face value, I get the five billion, you get a bunch of paper that's worth essentially nothing. Okay. And so a lot of problems like that occurred during the uh, during 2008, okay, and even before that, and that was the reason for, or at least one of the reasons, for the uh, financial crisis. Um, if you want to see more on credit default swaps, um, you should visit the Khan Academy. Uh, Sal Khan has a series of these. He's done a very good job of explaining the credit default swap in, in more detail than I have. Um, and uh, so if you want to carry on with that, that's a good way to follow up with this.